Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope lunch has served you well. Was the morning session boring or what? I thought it was fabulous, and we thank all our faculty, and we are going to move on to our afternoon sessions. By the way, we love your questions. Keep on rolling. We may not be able to answer each and every one of them, and I apologize, but due to time constraints, but we'll try and catch, get to all of them if possible. So we love those, so keep on, keep, keep, keep on sending those. The next speaker I have a pleasure of introducing is one of my friend and my colleague. He's a fellow international cardiologist, Dr. Kunapali. He runs our cath lab program out in Willowbrook, Willowbrook Methodist, and he's one of the busiest interventional cardiologists I know of. So welcome, Dr. Kunapali, who's going to talk to about what is the best reperfusion ther therapy in STEMI patients. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, and thank you, Dr. Zogby, for having me here. I hope uh, none of us are going to need reperfusion after a nice barbecue. <laughs> so the topic I'm going to talk about is reperfusion and ST elevation myocardial infarction. It is a rather an expansive topic, uh, but it's also quite important because it is life-saving. If I have to sum it up in two slides, the entire talk, it's this. Everyone needs to be reperfused, and currently PCI is the best option for reperfusion. So that's my disclosures. Roughly half a million people have coronary artery disease every year. This is the heat map. Right now we are hot in Texas for heart disease. Dr. Jones probably talked to you guys this morning about evolution of plaque. This, these are our arteries starting at the right when we are born and to when we're 40 years of age. There's two kinds of plaque. There's vulnerable plaque and there's stable plaque. Vulnerable plaque is, I, I call it, it's like creme brulee, very thin layer on the top and very bad stuff in, inside. You don't want vulnerable plaque. Why is it important to know these plaques? Because that what, that's what forms the basis of the entire spectrum of acute coronary syndrome. Plaque rupture then leads to either non-ST elevation myocardial infarction or ST elevation myocardial infarction, which is complete occlusion of an epicardial coronary artery resulting in cessation of blood flow. This little pictorial will show uh, what happens. Plaque ruptures, the, everything inside the plaque is exposed you get platelet aggregation, which then forms a thrombus. Why is it important to know this? It's because this is where therapies act, either fibrinolysis or the, uh, the, uh, the anticoagulants that we use. So once again, for all groups of patients that present with STEMI, coronary artery reperfusion is the basis and needs to be uh, performed either with primary PCI or fibrinolysis. Why? Because it improves myocardial salvage and reduces mortality. PCI is preferred compared to fibrinolysis if it can be performed by an time, in a timely fashion by an experienced expert operator. When it's not available, you need fibrinolysis. Some of the things that you may encounter, these are more Emergency room terms, door to needle, door to balloon, and PCI related delay. So most, cause, most cases of STEMIs are caused by plaque rupture. Plaque ruptures, you get a occlusion of the epicardial coronary artery. Patients with STEMI should re re receive reperfusion, either with PCI or fibrinolysis. And this is true for all patients that present within the first 12 hours. So what do we have? We have either fibrinolytics or mechanical. Some key items regarding thrombolytics or fibrinolytics. Even though PCI remains the reperfusion strategy of choice, it's not available everywhere. There's a lot of hospitals in the United States and elsewhere. These hospitals may not have PCI capability or may not have backup surgery. So 
what do you do in such cases? You need to know about fibrinolytics. Fibrinolytics are plasminogen activators. They are serine proteases that participate in the lysis of fibrin by converting plasminogen to plasmin. So there are three kinds. There's fibrin-specific agents, there's intermediate fibrin-specific agents, and then there's non-fibrin-specific agents. You've probably heard this term before, time is muscle. It comes from time is myocardium, meaning that the earlier you can get to open an artery, the better it is. With every hour that progresses, the myocardium uh, is progressively dying, and the first two to three hours are considered the most critical time. This pictorial shows you what happens when an epicardial coronary artery on the top here is open and it's not open. And so subsequently, the myocardium ends up dying. A little bit of a historical perspective, 1933, first paper that was published, Tillett and Garner, they uh, described the fibrinolytic activity of beta hemolytic strep. Then they used this in dissolving a fibrinous clot in a pleural fusion. That's the first paper they published, uh, effect of patients with streptococcal fibrinogen. So once again, there are serine proteases. They participate in the lysis of converting uh, of fibrin by converting plasminogen to plasmin. There are fibrin-specific agents, intermediate fibrin-specific agents, and non fibrin specific agents. This is a slide you should probably know and get asked for. What are the absolute and what are the relative contraindications for giving fibrinolytics? Most of the time, the ER physicians are the ones that encounter patients that they need to give fibrinolytics. Basically, the take home message for this is anyone that has had an intracranial bleed, anyone that has had an acute stroke, anyone that has had aneurysms intracranially. There's one caveat to this, is that if you've had a acute ischemic stroke within the last three hours, you can get TPA, so that is the caveat. Streptokinase was the original fibrinolytic agent. It's a single chain polypeptide. It's derived from beta hemolytic strep. It binds to plasminogen, makes a complex. For acute MI, streptokinase is administered 1.5 million units over 60 minutes, and all patients that get streptokinase get aspirin 325. Problems with streptokinase, you develop an allergic reaction. You can either develop that the first time, or you can develop a IgE-mediated allergic reaction the second time around. Patients are known to have hypotension during streptokinase administration, and then the third is bleeding with all fibrinolytic agents. The first trial that showed a mortality benefit with fibrinolytics was the GISI trial. It was a large trial, about 12,000 patients, and it showed a remarkable uh, degree of benefit when fibrinolytics were used in acute MI patients. Second. Fibrinolytic is alteplase or TPA, something that is used more commonly now. It's a recombinant type of plasminogen activator. It, it's a naturally occurring enzyme that's a serine protease, and it's produced by a lot of cells in our body. In contrast to streptokinase, it's fibrin-specific, so that forms an important key point. And it's also front-loaded and has a short half-life. All patients receiving TPA should receive heparin. And when studied in the GUSTO trial, it showed a mortality benefit uh, compared to streptokinase. Problem with TPA, patients can develop edema, oral and uh, uh, lingual edema. And uh, this can be rare, but when it happens, it can be severe. Retoplase is RPA, a recombinant plasminogen activator. It's less fibrin uh, selective than TPA. That's pretty much, it's not used much, so you don't see it often and you don't hear about it very often. The one that's used nowadays 
and the, is the uh, drug of choice for acute MI patients in the United States and Canada is tenecteplase. TNK, TPEA. It's genetically engineered. It's a multiple point mutant uh, uh, of recombinant TPA. It's got a long plasma half-life. So why is that important? You can give one dose and it's, it acts. It's 14 times more fibrin specific than streptokinase. The TIMI 10A and TIMI 10B trials were the ones that basically showed significant mortality benefit. However, when looked at higher doses, there really is no benefit for tenecteplase at higher doses. And then the last one, lenotoplase, is not even used anymore uh, because of increased risk of strokes in patients. So, fibrinolytic agents, if you have to uh, to summarize it, it says that the, if someone presents with a STEMI, the choice is primary PCI. If you don't have primary PCI, fibrinolytic agents. Currently, the fibrinolytic agent of choice is tenecteplase. The absolute contraindications are intracranial bleeds, intracranial hemorrhage, intracranial aneurysms, and there's relative contraindications. This is the dosing chart for patients that uh, get fibrinolytic agents. So moving on, if not fibrinolytic agents, what is the other option? It's the option of choice, primary PCI. What does primary PCI mean? Primary PCI is when you take someone to the cardiac catheterization lab, do a coronary angiogram, cross the lesion with a wire, and inflate a balloon. That is percutaneous coronary intervention. So percutaneous coronary intervention refers to either PTCA, PCI, drug uh, placement of either bare metal stent or drug eluting stent. It passes the whole thing. The current treatment of choice, ACC, SCA guidelines uh, recommend primary PCI to be performed in all acute MI patients within 120 minutes of first medical contact, ideally within the first 90 minutes when they come. So that is what you call the door to balloon time. When they come into the emergency room and you're rushing them and when the way that you record door to balloon time, they hit the door in the emergency room, you take them up to the uh, cath lab, you cross the lesion, you, br you open, you restore blood flow, that's your door to balloon time. That, and 90 minutes is a number you want to beat because that's where you get your greatest benefit for myocardial salvage. A lot of trials, about 23 of them, that showed PCI versus fibrinolytic agents. What is better? PCI, significantly better. Primary PCI versus, uh, uh, with balloon angioplasty versus fibrinolysis, significantly lower mortality of 30 days, lower rate of death and reinfarction with PCI, i.e. PTCA versus fibrinolytic agents. This was first in the PAMI-1 trial, then the Denami, Prague, and Stop Amy trials. A couple of other times when you have uh, patients that present with pericarditis, left bundle branch block, diagnosis that is not very clear, you can't give them fibrinolytic agents. <laughs> PCI is the preferred route of choice. When is fibrinolysis preferred? It's preferred in patients that show up after the 120 minutes or if you don't have a PCI performing center. That's pretty much the only time. The one thing that I wanted to emphasize, something that you may see is what's called facilitated PCI, meaning that you're transporting someone to a PCI facility and what do you do? There is really no data that supports that give them fibrinolytic agents then go for a planned PCI. If it's a rescue PCI, yes, but not for a planned PCI. The third option is cabbage, coronary artery bypass grafting. For STEMI, not very often, and patients that do need it are often very sick. These are patients that have either had a complicated or unsuccessful PCI, either that have had a complication with acute MI, or they present with STEMI and continue to have recurrent cardiogenic shock or ischemia. How long do you wait for these patients? You usually wait till they cool down. It can be anywhere from six hours to a couple of days. Who do you not reperfuse? Obviously, people that don't want to be reperfused, number one, that have 
serious, severe end-of-life issues or hospice, or you know, patients that uh, you, uh, have bleeding risk. So once again, the take-home message, patient presents with STEMI, you have two reperfusion strategies, fibrinolytic agents or PCI. If they can be taken to the cath lab within the first 120 minutes, ideally within the first 90 minutes, call the interventional cardiologist. If not, and if you can give them fibrinolysis, if there's going to be a delay, that's the only time that you should be get, getting fibrinolytics. Uh, anyone with intracranial bleeds or active bleeds is not a candidate. 